Cool. So welcome to our first session of today's installment of Interact Virtual Festival. Uh, today's theme is the future of design, and we've got three great talks for you um, now at one o'clock and at four o'clock today. Um, there's still time to sign up to this afternoon's talks for Eventbrite, and there are a few places left. Um, so if you haven't done so, um, please do so. Um, big thanks to our sponsors, Balsamic, um, all of our speakers uh, and everyone watching. Um, our first talk today is on digital therapeutics, uh, the future of healthcare um, by Dr. Giles Morrison, uh, a clinical user experience specialist and digital health consultant, improving the usability, accessibility, and fun people have with healthcare technology. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A box uh, and I'll try to ask Giles as many as I can at the end. Uh, and if there's any issues with audio um, or anything like that, then please let us know in the chat function and we'll do our best to fix it. Um, please do say hello to each other um, in the chat box as well. Um, and I will hand over to Giles to kick things off. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today or for you to be joining me in this recording. So yeah, let's kick things off then. So my talk is Digital Therapeutics, the Future of Healthcare. I intend to discuss a bit more about obviously what digital therapeutics are, which obviously um, it's quite a complex topic. It's not going to be easy to, to cover it and say like a half hour, 40 minute talk, but it should give you a general overview of what it is, what the benefits are of digital therapeutics and what are some of the hallmarks, the features of really great digital therapeutics. So I'm not actually going to go through any specific digital therapeutic products. This isn't about case studies. It's more about general knowledge that can be applied to any digital therapeutic project. So if you're working on a digital therapeutic product, this talk should help you quite a lot. And if it's an area that you're interested in, it should also help you get a bit more insight on first steps to make a great product. So first things first. Then. There are about 4.8 billion mobile phone users in the world. That equates to approximately 61.51% of the world having a mobile phone. When we say mobile phone, we are not just including iPhones or you know, the latest Pixel, Google phone, Androids. We are talking about like the Nokia 3210s from back in the day. There's a few of us that are old enough to remember those sort of phones. The ones that you know, were quite big, as big as your head, um, but they will last, the battery will last like a month um, and a year. But um, those, those phones uh, have such a variety of features. So the regular mobile phone of function phone, as well as touchscreen phones, all of those combined, you're talking about nearly two thirds of the planet have access to them. And specifically smartphones, that's more towards just under half, about 44, 45% of the world. Now, these mobile phone users globally, you know, can have access to at least, at least 320,000 healthcare apps. So any app that can do something to improve your health or well-being. Now, this statistic actually comes from a few years ago, and I would imagine it could be almost double that amount, but let's still deal with the facts that I've been able to collect from my research. It's gonna probably be around four to 500,000, which is still an incredible amount. Now, despite there being so many phone users and there being so many healthcare apps, still the startling results that you get when you look at um, papers from the World Health Organization is that more people have access to a mobile phone than to essential healthcare services. So literally someone can be born and statistically, they are more likely to have access to a mobile phone than to services to keep them healthy. Despite good health being a human right, this is still part of the reality that we're, that we're facing. So, a big thing that digital therapeutics can do, even with mobile phones, so you don't have to have, you know, the latest iPhone, the latest Google Pixel, even though I kind of do fancy that Pixel 5. Um, you don't have to have the latest phone in order to create digital therapeutic, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I would argue that we could be empowering people to take more control of their health, to have better health outcomes, for clinicians to be able to provide better healthcare services if we can utilize this tool that a lot of people have. 
As you can see in the background, this is a gentleman who has no fixed abode, doesn't have a home. He's got a mobile phone. He even has access to a power supply. He does not have a house. He does not have a home to live in, but he still has the means to use a mobile phone for communication with friends, loved ones, with healthcare services, with anybody he needs to interact with, he can still do that with a mobile phone, even though he doesn't have a house. So we need to get with the time, get with the program. We can be doing more for people who are poor, who are suffering. And I believe that digital therapeutics is part of the solution, not the only one. As we know, if people are poor, you give them money, they're not poor, that helps them have better life outcomes. It's not, it's not rocket science. So let's get to digital therapeutics then in more detail. So what is a digital therapeutic? So a digital therapeutic or DTX for short is any evidence-based digital technology that prevents, manages or treats ill health. Now we're gonna break down these uh, particular points within this definition. So evidence-based, this means that you need to be able to prove what the product can actually do. If you don't have any evidence for this, people are gonna be a lot less likely to use the product. In particular, you know, you, you go onto any app store, Apple, Android, whatever else, you'll see a product. You're gonna look at the reviews. You're gonna see how other people have mentioned any issues that they faced or any features that they really like. You may be looking at the updates, the latest version of the product. What, what have the developers of this digital app done recently to make it great? When was the last update? Was it actually five years ago or just five days ago or even five hours ago? What's actually going on with making sure that this product really can deliver what it needs to do? Now, when you look at conventional medical interventions, could be a drug, could be surgical intervention, could be even just the practice of watching the symptoms that someone has and seeing if anything progresses. There's evidence base for it. There would have been clinical trials, there would have been experiences that clinicians have had that they've shared on a global level over generations even, that talks about best practice. The same thing applies to digital therapeutics. You need to have that evidence base, that proof that what you're doing actually is true. It actually has health outcomes. Further to this then is the prevention part. So if a digital technology is preventing a disease, it, as the name would suggest, it means that someone could have had the risk of having a disease and the intervention being provided by this digital platform lowers or removes that risk of harm, of ill health, of something leading to someone being sick. Now, manages and treat is similar, but they're still a bit different. Manage is particularly done when you've got chronic illness that can't be cured. You're supposed to provide interventions that can keep someone as healthy as possible, given the fact that they've got a diagnosis that's lifelong or could even be progressive. So you could be slowing down the progress or halting the progress altogether. But reversing what's happened isn't always the case. Whereas treatment, however, that should be the case. When you're treating something, it should be usually leading to some sort of cure. You know, someone has, um, is having a, uh, an asthma attack. They can be given treatment so that the actual tightness in the chest is completely removed. You don't necessarily cure the disease, like it could happen again, but that episode has stopped. Whereas if someone, for example, has got chronic pain, you might be taking painkillers that numbs the pain a bit. It's not completely removing it. Digital therapeutics would not be necessarily using a drug, but they could be. And we'll talk about this a bit more in how digital therapeutics actually do what they do. And then the last thing then, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, is that um, ill health is literally anything that is the opposite of good physical or mental well-being. So you being stressed is technically ill health. Like a lot of people don't like to appreciate that stress, anxiety, being a bit frustrated, as much as they're normal and common feelings, if it is stopping you from functioning, if it makes it difficult to perform tasks, to think, to do things, then actually that is your mental health being impaired. So anything that can prevent, treat or manage how you're feeling physically or mentally, digitally is a digital therapeutic. And it's a good digital therapeutic if it actually achieves what it's trying to do and has an evidence base to back it up. The other thing I want to briefly mention is the fact that when we're talking about how digital therapeutics work, 
it doesn't just have to be a digital interface. In fact, better digital therapeutics often combine a user interface, a screen, with perhaps some sort of physical device that can be assessing more that's going on with you. And it can be utilizing a variety of other technologies. So a good example, I said I wasn't going to do those case studies, but one comes to mind. You could be using something like Dexcom, which is specifically an infusion pump for insulin. Now it has to also work with perhaps another tool, another platform or, or, or sensor that can detect what is your current blood sugar reading. Give that information to the Dexcom, it then ensures that the insulin that you get is appropriate throughout the day, depending on what you've been eating. And this is a really, really great way that a digital therapeutic can combine with a wearable technology to have better health outcomes and achieve better results. So it's also important to keep in mind that these solutions can include artificial intelligence. You know, machine learning, where it's reading situations, where this scales to the next level in what's known as computer vision. So we're talking about literally a computer is able to see with cameras and hear with microphones and assess what's going on around you. This can be combined with some sort of simple interface for a person where they can manage their disease at home and not having to go into hospital as much, particularly good for elderly people with a variety of diseases. So this is just a little bit of, you know, tempting you to know a little bit more about digital therapeutics, but let's get more into the meat and potatoes of it. So why are digital therapeutics so important? So in short, they're, they're revolutionizing healthcare. As alluded to before, when they are used well, they can really impact the lives of the most vulnerable people. And we'll talk about this a bit later in the talk. So this revolution is coming whether you like it or not. And I wanna explore 10 particular reasons why they're so important. So the first one is that digital therapeutics empower patients helping them to take charge of their own health and making them more likely to become and stay healthy. This is really, really, really important that it's, it's very common that people can feel that they only have to rely on the clinician to get better, that they have to go to a pharmacist, they have to speak to a doctor as the only way to deal with their health. Where digital therapeutics can shift that responsibility, shift that focus, so an individual can actually take more charge of it and actually have better results if they are more involved in the day-to-day -day of what's being done as an intervention to improve health, remove disease. Digital therapies also lower the burden of care for clinicians. So clinicians can focus on the patients who really need their input and less time on admin tasks. Right? As someone who's worked as a doctor myself, there's a ridiculous amount of digital paperwork that you have to do every time you see a patient. Anytime you actually interact with a patient, you should normally be logging it down, that you have to keep a, a record of it. Part of the reasons um, would tie in with the fact that there's a lot of suing that goes on. <laughs> but it's also so that if you have to hand over that care to somebody else, they know what's going on. But if suddenly the clinicians aren't having to be involved in the care of the patient every single day, it's more the patient dealing with it, suddenly there's less admin tasks that's associated with it. And there's more focus on what do I need to use of my actual medical training and medical experiences to improve health outcomes for my patients. Digital therapeutics can also improve treatment adherence to maintain effective therapeutic action and thus improve health outcomes. So for example, if you're on a particular drug where the dose has to change depending on your symptoms and severity of the disease, could be some sort of blood test or some other investigation that determines what is the appropriate dose. All of this decision-making process, this whole processing of the data to conclude what is the appropriate dose could be done through a digital therapeutic. It could normally be done by a doctor or other healthcare professional, but instead you pass that responsibility to a digital product that you know works. It has to be an evidence-based, otherwise you could kill somebody. But you make sure that it can work and suddenly you've removed some of that need for a clinician to be involved. Next, is that digital therapeutics can provide care in new ways, helping patients beyond the capabilities of modern medicine or otherwise satisfy unmet needs. A common unmet need is how are you going to provide regular services to someone that lives in a very rural part of the world? How are you going to provide regular medical services to someone who does not have a fixed abode? Like you cannot always have an opportunity to see them face-to-face -face because they're sleeping rough. 
How are you, how are you going to serve them? How are you going to serve people who want to have better health outcomes but simply can't pay to physically spend time with you? Like they can't pay to travel to get to you, let alone pay the fees to see the clinician. How, how are you going to provide services to them? These are challenges that governments should be tackling and where digital therapeutics can help. Digital therapeutics also complement other forms of therapy, enhancing their effect and improving healthcare outcomes when used in conjunction. So as highlighted in this example through the icons, you've got an app that could tell you what drugs you're supposed to be taking. It can help you, you know, remember if you've taken the right drug, get reminders of when you should be taking it next. Log down any symptoms that you could be feeling, anything like side effects, anything else that's worth noting down for the clinician that's looking after you. But if this is relating to chronic pain, you can then see a physiotherapist face-to-face. -face. There are times, even in a pandemic, people do see each other face-to-face. -face. Um, I know it's kind of hard to, to remember those days, but still. Anyway, you're going to have this face-to-face -face interaction with somebody. And it's like, well, these are the exercises I need you to do to help deal with your chronic pain. When you take the pain relief, it makes it easier to do some of these exercises. But so you don't have to just memorize it, because it's really hard to just memorize it in the beginning is a video which goes to your app. And it's not just any old video, it's a video that you are in. They've recorded you doing the exercise so you can see how it's done. And they've given you personalized advice on how you need to position your body because it's not just this, how you do the exercise in general, but you could be doing it as an individual, a bit different because you're human, you're not perfect. And so this then leads to a cycle where someone goes back to the app, they get more information from that which guides them on the next treatment that they're doing on their own, followed up by next level treatment that they get from the physiotherapist, other clinician that they're seeing face to face. Next is that digital therapeutics provide personalized care as alluded to before, which users are more trusting and receptive of, and thus more likely to achieve great healthcare outcomes. Anything that has a personal touch is always more effective. Let's think about it. If I was to give you a birthday cake, I'm sure that's that alone will make you very happy. But if you're gluten intolerant and I had that cake full of all of that wheat, I don't think you'd be as happy. So what if I personalized it by making sure that it was um, you know, great for someone who is gluten intolerant? Now, people don't appreciate that that is personalization. You're taking the needs, wants, and limitations that someone has, in particular, the dietary requirements that someone has, and you're making sure that it is great for them. But the other way is I can personalize it by putting your name on it. So you're just saying happy birthday. It's like happy birthday and insert your name. This is a much better cake because it's personalized. It's something that recognizes you as an individual, you as a human being, rather than just someone who happens to have a birthday or happens to, to actually want some cake. It's taking these different things into consideration, improves someone's emotional reaction to it in a positive way. And you want actually to do as much as possible to encourage someone to be happy with what they're interacting with. This intimately ties in with the concept of behavior change, which we'll talk a little bit more later. But anything that can be done to make someone more positive about the experience is going to encourage them to interact with this product or service that's being made. Now, digital therapeutics also support the collection and analysis of health data, aiding ongoing analysis and subsequent optimization of healthcare provision. So for example, we've got track and trace, we know there's been, there's been some really terrible problems with track and trace, but there's times when actually it's been successful. It depends on who's had the decision-making process as their responsibility on what the product does. But let's assume you've got a good track and trace product. It can get data on an individual level, but this individual data combined can tell you how many people in a particular geographical region are sick with COVID or not sick with COVID. It can tell people and an individual level, how much at risk are you of getting COVID where you are? But it can also tell governments um, internationally or just on a national level, you know, how likely are certain parts of their country gonna have, you know, a sudden outbreak of the pandemic of COVID-19 or that certain places are actually recovering. It can then lead to the decision-making process or what interventions need to be done. Are you gonna do a lockdown? Are you gonna have some sort of restrictions? Are you actually gonna tell people that now, things are actually a lot better. You can be reassured. And this information can be communicated through this same track and trace app. That's how data collected on an individual level can improve the health and outcomes of a huge population, if not the population of the world. Now, digital therapeutics can also reduce healthcare costs 
by treating and managing ill health sooner through less expensive means, if not preventing ill health altogether. So let's take the example of someone who's just been discharged. They perhaps have had, you know, heart failure. You know, they have a bout of a time when they're onboarded, too much fluid, they get edema, so swelling of the feet and legs. This can cause a lot of pressure on the heart, breathlessness, severe problems. Just people could die if they don't have the fluids taken off their body, particularly off their lungs. So you've been discharged with this. You can then be told what to do through a digital app that can lower your risk of having to be readmitted or if through certain features such as your weight, because your weight will increase if you're retaining fluid, your weight is changing quite a lot, then maybe it means coming to the hospital sooner. Don't deteriorate at home where when you do eventually present to the hospital, you're more likely to have much worse health outcomes, if not death. You know, get the intervention in much sooner because we recognize that there's a problem sooner. Or in the case of something like track and trace, if it's done well, you could be told don't go around these places because that's where there's a higher risk, preventing getting COVID in the first place. But also digital therapeutics, it's a very lucrative global market, very lucrative. At the moment, it's valued at around 3.1 billion US dollars. That's just 2020 alone. And it's been theorized, been projected to treble in that global market price in the next seven years. This huge, about 12, over 12 billion, 12 billion US dollars for one type of product. If you're in that field, you will make money if you make real product that solves a real problem. So it's a crucial thing. You can't just enter this game and just create any old digital therapeutic. You want to create one that's actually going to solve a problem for people. And that if you're not solving real problems, then why would people pay for it, be it government or individuals? And then finally, digital therapies can reduce health inequalities by providing solutions that target vulnerable people while still supporting those who can satisfy their health needs through other means. So for example, if I can create a product that can teach people about the you know, signs and symptoms of what happens if someone's having a stroke, because you may not be able to quickly get someone else to assess them. You know? This allows you to then know what to do when someone has been sick and then suddenly take them to the hospital. That's one, that's one part, the really, really simple part. But the other part is if you have created a means that is easy for someone who's blind, deaf, you know, otherwise handicapped to interact with the knowledge of what to do next. So you've made it accessible to someone deaf to understand what's going on. You've made it accessible to someone who's blind to understand what's going on. People who are not deaf and are not blind are still gonna be able to understand what you've said. This is why we have um, conferences, even like this one, that has captioning, we have subtitles. So you can read it because there's people who actually don't want to have sound, even though they can hear, because it's an inconvenience because of the place that they're in. So you've made something accessible to people who actually could have worse health outcomes if they don't get the information because of them being deaf, but actually someone who can hear can still consume it. So you're not going to be having anybody who already is fine with accessing the communication, any problems. You're, you're, you're simply making it more accessible. The same thing ties in with actual healthcare services. There's times where you just need to provide the information about a disease to more people so that they can be empowered to do something about it. You would hope though that doctors, other clinicians who already know about diseases quite well would already proactively go and seek medical attention if they see certain signs and symptoms. And something as simple as knowledge of when to see a doctor we take for granted is the, it can be the sole reason why someone dies. Literally, they don't know that something is serious enough because information about it has not been spread enough. This ties in intimately with health inequalities and understanding, well, what is the cause of it? What is the difference? Is it knowledge? Is it money? There's more of these reasons which we'll come to in a bit. But before I go on, I wanna talk some more about what is needed to make a great digital therapeutic. So let's explore this in a bit more detail. The first one are PREMS. PREMS are patient recorded experience measures and are patient completed questionnaires which assess patient experience. So what's quite common in the UK, something known as the friends and family test, 
It's a simple set of questions, two questions, just to know generally how um, how would you rate the services that you got when you dealt with this NHS intervention, and would you recommend it to a friend or family member? Just as simple as that. And this information is really useful because it tells you what's working, so you do more of what's good, and what's not working, so you explore that more, you create some sort of intervention so the service is better. So it's a great way of quality improving the actual service that you're providing or the product that you're um, providing by getting that feedback. Next now are PROMs, which are patient recorded outcome measures and are evidence-based healthcare questionnaires which identify changing health status. So for example, you could be filling in a questionnaire that assess whether you are depressed or not. It could also assess whether you are suicidal risk or not. It doesn't necessarily encourage someone to commit suicide just asking them, do you feel suicidal? But it could, depending on the answers that someone who fills this in, determine, is this someone who I need to worry about their mental health because it could actually take their life. Now, PROMs are extremely powerful in digital therapeutics. When you have the right PROM, it can literally remove the need of a clinician to assess the patient. At least a first level assessment. Just someone says, I have a problem. You can fill in a PROM, particularly if it's tied to a chronic illness, and depending on the outcome of that PROM, what result is found, the digital therapeutic tells you, seek medical intervention, change your medical dose, try this lifestyle change, this you know, exercise regime, this diet, you know, or even be reassured, everything's fine. This is really, really powerful because when that decision-making process of what to do next is done by digital product, you're removing the burden of need for clinicians. The other cool thing about digital therapies is that you need to be using clinical best practice. This is very much tied to this whole area of evidence base, but it's talking more so about the specifics of if your digital therapeutic is tied to a specific disease, let's take diabetes. You need to understand diabetes in order for it to work well. Not just understand diabetes, but what is the journey that someone goes through from the moment where they're like, oh, I don't feel very well to I'm now cured of my type two diabetes or my type one diabetes is managed very well with a specific regime of insulin that I understand fully how to do. And I don't progress into any micro or macular vascular complications of the disease. You know, problem, people who have diabetes can get problems with their eyes, with their fingers, with their toes, all these sort of issues. So here we're gonna use a combination of clinical pathways which are uh, evidence-based patient care management tools, which detail the best way to treat specific groups of patients with predictable clinical journey. So for example, someone presents with you know, sweating and excessive urinating, people will have diabetes. But if they're also really lethargic to the point where they go into an unrousable sleep, that can still be diabetes, but I'm also concerned that this person is going to hypoglycemic um, um, incident with any serious intervention, otherwise they could die. Now, there's different presentations that someone has based on the same disease, and so there's different ways you're gonna manage them as a clinician, different ways you're gonna provide treatment to them. This is clinical pathways. Now, care plans are very similar to clinical pathways, but they're specific in actually the instructions for an individual patient. Now, those instructions can be quite generalized because there's not that many differences between individuals who have a certain disease. There's not that many different ways to categorize them. But ultimately, you're still going to um, give them some sort of specific instructions, which could either be useful for the patient themselves or other clinicians that see them. You need to use a combination of clinical pathways and care plans in your digital therapeutics so that you maximize the ability to prevent, manage, and treat disease. Regulation is a massive part. Virtually all digital therapeutics are considered software as a medical device and the main reason when that happens is when the decision-making process of what needs to be done for the prevention, the treatment, and the management is done by the digital product itself. When the decision-making process is done by a human, it's still a digital therapeutic, but it may not necessarily be a software as a medical device, because medical devices must adhere to strict regulation. And if you don't adhere to it, your product can't go on the market. It will be illegal. To sell it would literally be illegal. It's pretty much the case for almost all countries. They will have some sort of regulation around medical devices. And in the case of a digital therapeutic or other digital solutions, a software as a medical device. Now, you need to make sure that what you're making is clinically validated. 
opposed to GDPR rules or any other sort of patient security privacy laws that govern the land of the people in the country that use it, but also the country of the people who are managing the solution. There's times where you could be making a product for a patient base or client base that's in another part of the world. But if you can access the data in your country, you've got laws that govern how you use that data in your country. Next then is behavior change theory. So behavior change theory is basically any practically applicable theories on how humans and animals contemplate and enact behaviors. And I say humans and animals because the whole thing about digital therapies isn't just for humans. We can apply this to veterinary medicine as well. Now, behavior change theories are needed as it is behavior change that you are trying to accomplish with a digital therapeutic. Just think about it. A digital therapeutic um, or any digital therapeutic, they're, they're generally designed to reduce, if not remove, the need to see a healthcare profession. It's supposed to be removing that burden and empowering someone to do something on their own. Now, going to your mobile phone for all your common healthcare needs instead of a healthcare professional is a massive behavior change. Like it's already been a huge thing trying to get people to watch TV on their phone. We already were able to get a lot of people to play a game, but it's like, you're legit going to watch the latest episode of Lufa, The Walking Dead, you know, the latest Disney film, you know, reminisce about Chadwick Boseman dying and watch Black Panther again on your mobile phone. Now, this is really, really new for people. By saying that you no longer need to see your doctor when you're sick, just go to your phone. That's massive. That's huge. It's really, really huge. So you need to really understand about behavior change theory to do that well. And there's a variety of models out there. The main ones that come to mind would be um, Combi. I find it a little bit complicated, but it can work quite well when you've, when you've learned ins and outs of it. I find a reason action approach is really, really good. Um, the health belief model is also very, very useful, particularly with um, anything relating to health promotion. And there's also fog uh, behavior model. So the other big thing, of course, as a UX professional, best practice UX is crucial. The application of UX theory, including research methods, iterative design, and usability testing, is very, very necessary that we use the design process to solve many challenges we have, as it has been proven time and again, time, time, and again. Following a design process will save time, it will save money, it will save resources. You begin with some research to understand the problem, so that when you're coming up with solutions, the solutions are already are backed up by an understanding of the problem. And even when you're creating a solution, you're testing it. This is still research. This is still you ultimately answering as many questions as needed to come to a conclusion or make a decision. The decision is, this is the right problem to solve. The decision is, this is the right solution to the problem. So for most um, people, you know, they would assume that best practice UX involves user-centered design. But I actually teach something through the clinical UX course and something I've practiced personally, um, this concept of patient-centered, sorry, people-centered design. Um, and explain that actually user-centered design, the way that it's currently practiced, particularly in healthcare, can be quite flawed. It can lead to a lot of problems. And so when I teach for the clinical UX course at the Clinical UX Academy, you have to understand that it's bigger than just user-centered design. So user centered design very briefly is the concept that the needs, wants, limitations of the end user is kept at the center of all the decision-making process. So you're doing some research, you're coming up with ideas, you're testing them, you're delivering those and you're evaluating them. You're keeping the needs, wants and limitations of the end user in all of that. People-centered design says, well, I'm not just giving a digital therapeutic to a patient, I'm also helping the clinician see less patients and as data I can get from that digital therapeutic, they can allow them to assess what's going on with patients on a much larger scale, but also what, when they need to intervene with that patient, they can get an alert. It's also gonna impact the way that carers are looking after that patient. You know, What should they be doing to look after this person? It could be tying in with other services, social services, police, any aspects of law, and, and other people may need to have this data may have to have access to the outcome of this solution that you're making. This is people-centered design. You're gonna be thinking about all their different needs, wants, and limitations, as well as the end patient in all of everything that you do. So how can digital therapeutics improve health for all? So in short, it's, it's because 
if you are able to solve problems for the most vulnerable of people, people who may struggle the most, you will by definition have solutions that can also help people who are more capable of looking after themselves. This concept ties in what's known as a limiting user in UX design. So for those who are new to this topic, a limiting user is any legitimate user, someone who has a genuine need to use something, a product or service, right? Who may have difficulty engaging or achieving a goal with that product or service. So for example, we've got Tim here. Tim is a teenager. When he has got smelly socks, smelly drawers, he is old enough to go and use this washing machine. He shouldn't have any problems with the washing machine. He's a legitimate user, okay? But he doesn't have difficulties. Just because he doesn't want to use the washing machine is not a reason why he should not use it. He needs to get out of bed and wash his own dirty clothes. So he, you know, is not a limiting user, okay? He's a legitimate user, but he's not a limiting one. Pippa, on the other hand, I would argue is a limiting user. You know, she's getting older, she's getting on a bit. She's in her 80s, she's got good going arthritis. So when she has to push the open door button on the washing machine, it's quite firm. And her arthritis makes it quite difficult for her to open the door. Now, she's raised children. She's washed many clothes over the years. She knows how to use a washing machine and she's more than capable of doing it in general, but this button is quite firm. If you could make the button easier for her to press, to open the door to a washing machine, she wouldn't have any problems. So she's a legitimate user, but she's a limiting one because she has some difficulties with it. Laura now, what? She's three years old. What business does she have using the washing machine? We don't want the, the pet cat to have a bad um, hair day. She should not be using the washing machine. She is an abuser, okay? Abuser doesn't just mean someone who brings about harm in general, but is someone who inappropriately, inappropriately uses a product or service, okay? So Laura would be the abuser in this situation. She should not be using the washing machine to wash the cat. So limiting users ties into vulnerable people because a vulnerable person is any person who fails or is at risk of failing to have their basic human rights protected. Now keep in mind, everyone deserves to have good health, everybody. Not some people, not most people. Every single human being on the planet deserves to be healthy. So there's people who are limited in their ability to get good health care. They're gonna have problems in accessing good health care. They still need to be helped. Who are these people? The disabled are quite obvious group to think of, okay? People who have a physical disability, a mental disability, anything that can make it difficult for them to engage with services, or they are more of a risk of having certain diseases because of their disabilities. The elderly, people who, you know, they may not be as willing or as eager to seek out medical help at times. They can be a lot more vulnerable because of their frailty that happens just as a normal part of aging. As they get older, it's a bit harder to do things, which could lead to risk of injury or harm. Expecting mothers, they're not just vulnerable because of the very natural, normal state of being pregnant, makes them a bit vulnerable, makes them a bit more sensitive to certain changes in the environment. But also there's an unborn child that is completely dependent on the mother. They cannot do anything for themselves. And the same goes for the young, you know, as you get a bit older, it gets a bit easier, you know. I'm in my thirties. I think I can look after myself now. I have to ask my mum that one. But when you're a baby, when you're an infant, you still are heavily dependent on others around you. You can't actually deal with your health outcomes fully yourself. The abused, people who are actually um, victims of domestic violence in particular, they are at risk of um, being harmed or even killed. And in particular, this is someone, something that you are facing yourself. You don't have to be alone. You should speak up. It can be scary. I'm not saying it's easy, but you must speak up, seek out that help, tell somebody so that yes, you can get the help outcomes that you need. And this can be done anonymously um, as in there's anonymous services that can be contacted. There's ways. Um, the homeless, I said before, these are people who don't have a fixed abode. They're people who don't necessarily have access to food and drink when they need it to be able to relieve themselves, you know, bodily functions whenever they want. There's restrictions. These all can create huge health um, issues. The impoverished, if you don't have money to feed yourself, you're not going to eat. This is what happens. And then finally, the asylum seekers, people who have a legitimate need for healthcare services, but because they're not deemed as a legitimate citizen, they're denied it. This is happening all around the world. But the thing to keep in mind with the limiting user is that actually anybody 
in the world. Anybody can be a limiting user. Anybody could be sick. So who are you going to focus on? You need to focus on people who, like I said before, who have got the greatest need. Focus on those who are struggling the most. If you focus on them, there'll be loads of other people who will be able to get access to the solutions that you need. So in closing then, what's the next steps? How do we move forward? How do we actually start getting people together to bring about the solutions that's gonna have digital therapeutics and other solutions, other solutions that we may not even have thought of yet to help improve health for all. The first one is called to accept. We need to accept that there are people who are more vulnerable to dying, to getting sick than others. And we can't keep focusing on the people who've got a little bit more money, who've got you know, a little bit more understanding of how to manage their health. Like, yes, it makes sense to an investor to invest in digital therapeutic when you can guarantee getting sales. But if the cells are coming from someone who is already on a vegan diet, regularly going to the gym, they're planning to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. These are not unhealthy people. They're healthy people. Why are you focusing on improving their health when they're already healthy? Focus on the people who, you know, still need to have health outcomes and even could pay or governments can pay or there's some other business model in place that can fund the services. But the people who need the help Someone who has got, for example, um, irritable um, or inflammatory bowel disease. You know, if they've already managed their diet, why are you giving them an app to teach them how to manage their diet? You want to give it to the person who hasn't managed their diet, who's getting flare-ups of their IBD. That's that's what you should um, be focusing on. Ultimately, is how are you helping people who are suffering and accept that these are people that you need to focus on, because those who can help themselves will help themselves. They can even use your solution to help themselves. The next thing is call to action. It's about getting people that are working already in this field, as well as those who have the expertise. We're talking about the developers, the psychologists, the behavior change experts. We're talking about the product managers. We're talking about the investors. We're talking about big pharma. We're talking about a variety of healthcare startups. We're talking about healthcare accelerators. We're talking about governments. We're talking about all the different people who either have the expertise, they have the responsibilities, the authority, the capabilities, the finances to make change. We need to bring those people together and get them working with who? The UX designers, the UX professionals, especially the clinical UX designers, those who are trained in understanding the nuances of how to create digital therapeutics, to create digital solutions that improve health. We get these people together and need to get to work so there's a call to arms. People need to recognize there's a problem out there. Let's get together. Let's bring about a change. Let's bring about a solution to make things better. We need to bring in the UX professionals. We need to bring in that diverse skill set. Because it's not just design. There's also knowledge of healthcare. There's knowledge of psychology. There's knowledge of um, technology and of professionalism, of how to just make things work, of regulation, securities, laws, so on and so forth. Let's recognize that now is the time to be getting on with this stuff. The pandemic has opened our eyes to the fact that the conventional way of giving healthcare services has to change. So if this is something that you're particularly interested in, please know that I teach for the Clinical UX Academy. I provide the world's first and only online clinical UX course. And we're starting enrollment um, now for the course to start from October 24th. It's a 12 month program, which you can take part-time we can learn more about UX whilst you're in your day job. But it's all done approximately five hours a week. You need to devote to it. A combination of teaching as well as group work and opportunities to interact with others. There's no prior experience required. If you do, that's great. And particularly if you're a designer already, you can join the course a little bit later when other students have learned more about UX um, basic foundational principles or what I like to call the fundamentals of UX or fun UX. And you can study anywhere in the world. So if you want to find out more details, just head to clinicalux.org. And finally, to close, your greatest wealth is your health. This is the case for everybody, but especially you listening right now. We need to be looking at what we can do to keep ourselves healthy, 
When you have good health, everything else can come. Both physically and mentally, when you're in the right place, you can achieve so much. Thanks for listening and please stay in touch. Wow, that's super interesting. Thanks, Giles. Um, yeah, we have we have a few questions for you. Um, first up from Hazel, um, and I believe you kind of touched on this um, when you spoke about behaviour change. Um, how how can human trust in digital therapeutics be improved? Um, uh, and if you could share a few ideas uh, with people engaged in design development of digital therapeutics. Yeah, I think a big part of trust <clears throat> ultimately ties in with um, the concepts of relationships. So I, I like to liken this to some of the most intimate, most important relationships in marriage, okay? For you to actually say yes to someone's marriage proposal, you've got to trust them. What do you need to do? You need to have experiences with them. Those experiences need to be positive. There needs to generally be a net balance of positive experiences versus negative ones. And those positive experiences can't just be superficial because marriage is for life. It can't just be, well, you cook a really nice beans on toast. It's like, well, actually, what are you going to do if we can't pay the bills? What are you going to do if one of us gets really, really sick? What are you going to do if, um, you know, there's a death in the family and I'm, I'm suffering? What if I want to change my career? Like, there's going to be real problems. You need to, when you're building trust, provide evidence as quickly, as concisely as possible that can answer those unanswered questions tying to what is needed for this relationship to work. So for a digital therapeutic, it's like, will my doctor trust this? Will my doctor actually use something like this? Will they tell me to use it? Has this had a benefit in the lives of other people? No, what are other people saying? Is this something really gonna change my life? Like based on where I am at, where can this take me? And how realistic is that? Like, is it something I can even achieve? What's it gonna cost me? Not just money, but time, resources, heartache, if I don't achieve that. You need to answer these questions as quickly as concise as possible. And some of the ways is by literally just giving the answers, providing the testimonials from the clinicians, testimonials from the patients. It's also getting um, the, the user of the digital therapeutic to achieve some sort of success quickly. It could be that you've completed a very simple form. It says, you know what? I see you've got X, Y, Z problems with you. So try this, something that you can apply to your life right now. You don't have to wait for an appointment to get the intervention. You don't have to wait for an investigation to be ordered and then you hook up to the hospital to, to have it. Like you can actually change your diet now. You can have this new drug um, dose now because you've got the drugs at home. Like it's the intervention can happen now. Don't just wait. And this ties in a lot with what's done where people are playing computer games. Gamification is a real thing, folks. We're not saying that digital therapeutics have to be just like playing a game. But it's something about that instant gratification or some sort of reward, some sort of recognition for achievements in digital therapeutics or a great way to build trust and get people committed to, to using that digital product. Hopefully that answers your question. Awesome, thanks, Giles. Um, and then we have a question uh, from Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, if most digital therapeutics are medical devices, uh, how many of the 400,000 to 500,000 digital therapeutic apps you mentioned at the beginning actually meet this regulatory requirement? So it's very difficult to ascertain how many are really true, truly should be regulated and whether they have been regulated. Because even the, the criteria of what's a healthcare app can still be a little bit ambiguous when it ties into tools that maybe clinicians are using to provide healthcare services. But regardless of the criteria or how many apps that are in total on the market, I would argue that it's a tiny amount that are being regulated. There are a lot of cowboys out there. and I'm not talking about people that are on some farm dealing with cows. I'm literally talking about people who are taking a mick when it comes to making digital product. They are like, I've got some money, I've got an idea, let's make something, let's go, let's, let's punt it, let's just put it out there and let's see who's gonna be enough of a mug to just pay for it without the evidence. That's why it's very crucial in the definition of a digital therapeutic, it needs to be evidence-based. And for sure in the beginning, when products first went in the app store for Apple back in, I think 2008 or so, the novelty of being able to download an app that could help you with your health outweighed for a lot of people, the need to know that it could actually do what it does. 
And we're still seeing this sort of phenomenon now. How many people are talking about the wonders of having an Apple Watch and it's checking your heart rate? But let's get with the program. If you've never had a heart rate problem and suddenly you wear an Apple Watch that detects it, what are you actually going to do with that information? Like literally, what are you going to do in that moment? It's, you know, 11 o'clock at night, you're in your bed. It says you've got an irregular heart rhythm. It's not going into the specifics of why you've got an irregular heart rhythm, what's been the cause, what are you supposed to then do? So you could go to a doctor, but in the middle of the night, it's not an emergency, what are you going for? You know, is there some other cause for it? Like there is no service that wraps around the Apple Watch when it comes to someone having an irregular heart rhythm. And this is what you find is that people are seeing new technologies and like, wow, it's shiny, let's take it, grab. And it's like, well, no, what actually is going to be done to improve the health outcomes? A lot of people are not in that space. There's a lot of academics that are looking at this, but they're not in industry. They're just still working in the university. And this is the problem. You need to go through a scientific process to do some sort of experiment to get the evidence, but not enough people are doing this. I can't give you specific percentages, but some reports that I've seen has argued that it could be something as little as 10% or smaller, like it's ridiculously low. And so this is why there's a lot of healthcare apps that you simply should not trust. Normally I would say, as much as in the court of law, people should be innocent until proven guilty. We have a digital app. You should consider it to be a failure until proven that it can work. So hopefully that answers your question. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Giles. Um, I don't know. Um, I know you mentioned uh, your course, but I mean, what what advice would you give to anyone in UX that kind of wants to get into um, into kind of kind of designing digital therapeutics? Have you got any resources yeah. that you can share? So definitely, I would recommend the Digital Therapeutic Alliance. So they're a global authority on what it means to actually have a good digital therapeutic. They do provide some case studies of good digital therapeutics. So they'll talk about pair therapeutics, for example, and the work that they do in um, uh, the mental health of people who deal with substance abuse. But then also they tell you, well, what are the hallmark features of a good digital therapeutic? They talk about the process that you have to go through to be regulated and the highlight companies that you should be watching in this space. It can give you a bit of a, an idea of the areas you should be focusing on because a lot of digital therapeutics focus on chronic illness. Could be diabetes, a really big one. It's also now starting to go into anything that can you know, monitor the drugs that you're taking for, for any disease that you're suffering from. But we'll also slowly get into the area of mental health as well. So um, Digital Therapeutics Alliance and Google. You, you need to be just searching online for things. Search for articles, search for books. Search for events like just this one. You know, reach out to a variety of places. And, and the other thing I, I talk about with the concept of mixed learning is that it's a combination of stuff like courses and self-study, you know, or formal education if you've gone to university, but networking, connecting with others who are in this field, people who are just like you as a designer or as a clinician or as a non-designer, non-designer, non-clinician who's interested in this space. Connect with them, share what you've learned, find mentors, and then when opportunities come to put what you've learned into practice, go for it. Could be your own pet project, or you know, you find where time where you do a bit of pro bono work, or someone who is willing to pay you because you can add value to their project. Awesome, thank you, thank you very much. I think that's uh, that's all of the questions answered. Um, just like to say a huge, um, huge thank you to Giles for presenting. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure if people have any more questions, they can uh, they can contact you um, on the details on your slide there. Um, um, yeah, hope hope to see some more of you um, in the sessions later today. Cool, cool. Thanks, Giles. Thank you. Bye bye now. Thank you very much.